Hello everyone, in this video I will talk a bit about deep learning and how to approach a computer vision problem. Deep learning has become the default solution for image analysis, for several good reasons. It often works well, and it has become reasonably easy to get started with it and to train good models on home setups or on cloud infrastructures. It's relatively easy to build and train a model on a given dataset, but creating a deep learning solution to an image analysis problem is still challenging. The challenge is not so much in the coding itself, but more on how to correctly approach the problem. First, we will look at the general principles of how to approach a computer vision problem with deep learning. We will then use Python and TensorFlow to build a deep learning pipeline step by step and apply it to an example dataset. The first step in approaching a computer vision problem is to properly define the task. What are we trying to do? What are we trying to learn? What are we trying to achieve with our algorithm? This may seem like an obvious step, but it's actually both a very important step and a surprisingly complex one. The reason for that is that when we talk about a task, we are often confusing two related but sometimes significantly different tasks. One in the real world and one in the machine world. The real world task is usually the ultimate goal that we are trying to achieve. It's often framed as something that humans currently do. We observe the world around us and mix these observations with our knowledge and experience to do or to decide something. This task can be very vaguely defined as our brain typically works on experience and intuition more than formal logical reasoning. The machine world task cannot be vague. Machines don't have intuition, they have instructions. So the computer vision task that a computer vision algorithm solves always has to be very precisely defined. This definition typically comes in the form of a relationship between input data and a desired output. This relationship is mathematical. Given a data vector x and a desired output y, a computer vision algorithm will provide a function f which attempts to accurately map x to y. This is a bit abstract. So let's take two quick examples. One of the most famous machine learning competition is the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge, where one task consists in correctly labeling images from a large list of possible classes. For instance, this image is a mushroom. This is a classification problem, which is framed in a very machine-friendly way. It perfectly fits into the main requirements of the machine world. We are looking for a mathematical relationship between an input matrix representing an image and an output vector representing the probability of belonging to certain classes. But there is not really a real-world problem where being able to separate the specific classes which are part of the competition is the goal. So what is the real-world task that this competition represents? To quote the ImageNet website, the dataset was created to benchmark object recognition. So, it's not really concerned with the specific classes that are part of the challenge, but more with the larger question of how to derive meaning from photographs, for a general purpose understanding of images. The challenge is not built to solve a specific task, but to make it easier to compare different algorithms and to track our progress in object recognition in general. Another example from the medical field is the glass or gland segmentation challenge. The task being evaluated in the challenge is, as the name suggests, gland segmentation, with the input being microscopy images and the desired outputs a mask encoding which pixels are part of a gland. Again, this is not a real-world task by itself. To quote the Glass Challenge website, this segmentation is a crucial step in the process that human doctors use. The real-world task involves taking information from multiple sources, image-based or not, and compile them to form diagnostic. This distinction is really important because it's at the base of many incorrect reporting of deep learning results. Very often, we see headlines claiming that artificial intelligence is better than human experts at performing some task. But that task is usually the narrow machine world task that was specifically designed to be solvable by a machine. Usually, this artificial intelligence doesn't even attempt to really solve the underlying real-world problem, and therefore can't be said to be better than humans at it. The main point that I want to make here is this. 
The results of a computer vision algorithm on a computer vision task do not always reflect its real-world usefulness. A critical analysis of any computer vision problem always needs to answer the question, how well does the computer vision task and the datasets reflect the real-world problem? Now that we got that out of the way, let's focus a bit on what's behind that relationship between input data and desired outputs. If we take a look at our segmentation problem, our starting point is a color image of a tissue region under a microscope. If we want to apply a deep learning algorithm to this image, we know that we will have a deep learning model, such as a convolutional neural network, somewhere in the pipeline. But the deep learning model is never the only part. There will always be some form of pre-processing, such as rescaling, resizing, patch extraction, or data augmentation. There will also often be some form of post-processing, for instance, to clean up the segmentation mask if it's a bit noisy, or to stitch tiles back together if the original image was split in different parts. Finally, there will also be some evaluation at the end of the pipeline. The whole segmentation pipeline, as we've seen before, can be defined as a mathematical mapping with the segmentation mask Y being a function F of the input image X. Each of these steps will also be a mathematical function, and at this stage we can also know that these functions have different kind of parameters. The preprocessing, for instance, will be a function of the input, but may also depend on some thresholds, rescaling parameters, etc. Which preprocessing steps are applied is also by itself a parameter influencing the overall function. The same thing is, of course, true for the post-processing. For the deep learning model itself, we generally make a distinction between three different types of arguments to the function. The input, which here is the result of the preprocessing, the weights of the different connections within the neural network, and the other parameters of the model, such as, for instance, the number of layers, the number of feature maps, the initialization function, the learning rate, etc., etc. For all those parameters that relate to choices in the design of the overall algorithm, from the architecture of the network to any parameter of the pre- and post-processing steps, we will use the term hyperparameter. This is to make a distinction with what we generally mean by parameter of a deep learning model, which typically refers only to the weights of the model itself. The distinction is important, because the way that we find the hyperparameters and the parameters is different. The parameters of the model are set through the training process, when we fit some data into the model. The hyperparameters are set through the validation process, where we use a subset of the training data that we don't use to set the parameters to estimate the performance of the algorithm for different hyperparameters. So if we look at the whole available datasets, we always have to first split it into a training and test set, with the test set being used to evaluate the final performance of the algorithm. This split should be made as early as possible in the process, and we shouldn't look at the test set until we have what we consider to be the best version of the algorithm. To find this best version, we further split the training sets into a training and validation set, with the training set used to train the neural network itself, and the validation set used to check the performances of a pipeline with certain hyperparameters. The pipeline that has the best performance on the validation set is then used on the test set to get the final score of the algorithm. Let's now focus a bit on what we can find in a deep learning model. A deep learning architecture is first characterized by its inputs and outputs, which are constrained by the task. In a segmentation problem, typically the input will be an image of a certain size, let's say 256 by 256 pixels, with three color channels. And the output will be a binary mask, with also 256 by 256 pixels, and two channels encoding the probability of being in the background and in the foreground. We could also, in the binary case, use a single channel, but networks tend to learn better when they can separate the features that help them identify the positive class and features that help them identify the negative class. In between this input layer and this output layer, we'll have various successive layers which can just follow each other in a sequence, but which may also split in different branches or have some skip connections in some places. Let's quickly take a look at two different architectures and see what kind of layers we find. One of the most famous networks in deep learning is AlexNet, 
which won the 2012 ImageNet competition. It's a classification network, which takes as inputs a 224 by 234 by 3 image and outputs a vector of size 1000, corresponding to the class probabilities of the 1000 classes of the challenge. Between the input and output layers, we find three different kinds of layers. Convolutional layers, which find spatial regional features. Pooling layers, which are used to downsample the image through the network so that the higher level features can have contributions from a larger region in the original image. And dense layers, which remove the spatial information to combine all the features into class probabilities. Another famous network is the UNET segmentation network, widely used in medical imaging and introduced in 2015 in different biomedical challenges, such as cell tracking. As a segmentation network, the input of UNET is also an image, and the output is a segmentation mask. In between, we also find convolutional and pooling layers, but we don't have dense layers. Instead, since we don't sample the image with the pooling layers and we need to have an output that has the same size as the original image, we also have to introduce, to introduce unpooling or upconvolution layers, which do the opposite of the pooling layers and allow us to get back to the original size. We can also see that UNET is characterized by many so-called skip connections, providing shortcuts through the network. The idea here is that as we progress through the downsampling part of the network, we get higher level features but a lower resolution. So with the skip connections, we reintroduce the low level but high resolution features at later stages of the network, which hopefully results in a better resolution in the final output. There are other types of layers, for instance, regularization layers such as batch normalization or dropouts, but this is getting a bit out of the scope of this video. The main point here is that the same basic components are typically used in many different architectures, and the specificity of a given network is often in how these layers are arranged and combined. So how do we use all this information to approach an actual computer vision task? Let's keep with our gland segmentation example. The first thing we should do is look at the information we have on the dataset. This can help us both in making sure we correctly set up the validation and testing pipelines, but also in seeing how well the machine task reflects or not the real world task. As this dataset comes from a competition, we have some information available about its content. We can see, for instance, that the images come from colorectal cancer, we have information about which machine was used to acquire the images, and about the format. We can also see that there are 165 images in total, which are already split into a training and test set, with some coming from benign tumors and others from malignant tumors. What do we learn from that? First, that we already know that only 85 images will be used for the training and validation part, with 80 images being left out for testing. Keeping this split is important, as it means we can compare our results afterwards with the published results of the competition. We can already know also some of the limitations of using these datasets. There are not that many images and all were taken on the same scanner. This means that there is a high likelihood of some overfitting happening, and the results we get cannot be interpreted as a result on the general problem of gland segmentation. They will be the results of gland segmentation on colorectal cancer images taken from a Zeiss Mirax MIDI microscope at 20x magnification. With a high uncertainty, due to the limited number of patients involved. This does not mean that the results are worthless, by the way, just that we have to take them for what they are and not try to pretend that they are more general than they are. Now we have to translate the generic segmentation pipeline into something a bit more practical. What do we want to do with these images? As a pre-processing, we can do some resizing to have a fixed size input. We'll also probably need some data augmentation to compensate for the very low number of images. This should give us a training set that we can use to fit the parameters of the segmentation network. This would allow us in turn to get some training and validation performances and to tweak the different parts of the pipeline to get to something we feel is good enough. Once that is done, we can fix our final segmentation network and use it on images from the test set to get the test performances. That's a lot of things to do, but from a coding perspective, I can tell from that pipeline that I will have three main parts. First, a data generator, which will have to read images, do the pre-processing and data augmentation, 
and generate batches of image target pairs for training, validation, and testing. Then, a deep learning model, which will have as input batches of images and as output batches of masks. The main step for this deep learning model will be to train it with the training set to optimize the weight of the network. We may also have to add some post-processing at some point. Finally, we will have some evaluation code, which will take as input pairs of targets and prediction, and output some evaluation metrics. Let's plan out the next steps. First, we will create a skeleton code, just laying out the foundations of the pipeline with placeholders and making sure that we can connect everything together. Then we can fill in the placeholders with the code needed to process the glass data and a real network architecture. Once we have a pipeline running on the real data and that we get a sense of the kind of results we have, we can plan a few experiments. What do we want to test? How do we want to optimize our pipeline? Finally, we can let the GPU take over and run all those experiments until we have a final version of our algorithm that we can use on the test set for evaluation. Okay, let's start coding all of that. And as I've said, we'll start with a set of skeleton function that will simulate the whole pipeline and make sure that we can basically put everything together and link the different parts together. All the code I will show here will be available on GitHub. I put the link in the description and I'm running all of this on an Anaconda environment where the main libraries that will be used here are NumPy for numerical computing, Matplotlib to display plots, the, the images and the different graphs, scikit-image for basic image manipulation, and of course TensorFlow for the neural network models themselves. And I'm using TensorFlow version 2.1 on the GPU, so this would also work on the CPU but be significantly slower. And uh, it's also possible to run this on the cloud using either Google's platform with Google Colab, or for instance on Kaggle, there, is also, there are also environments that are available. So we'll start by defining four methods here. One for the data generator that will generate batches of data, which here will be just randomly generated and will simulate the batches that we'll have in our data sets. One to build a TensorFlow model that will be able to receive the batches from the data set and that will output masks of the same size as the images it receives as input, a method to fit the data sets to our model, and a method to evaluate the results of the model. Again, all of this will be fake data and a fake model, but it's just to make sure that we can link the different parts together so that afterwards we can easily just modify the content of these methods to use the real data sets and a real deep neural network. The data in a neural network is presented in batches, so the main parameters of our data generator will be the size of a batch, so how many images we show at each iteration of the learning process, the number of epochs, which means how many times we'll see the entire data sets in the learning process, and we'll here also need to add a number of batches per epoch. So normally this could be computed from the size of the data sets and the size of the batch, but since here we are generating data on the fly, we'll just specify the number of batches that we put in each epoch in our fake generator. And so the main loop of the generator will just to go for a certain number of epochs, so that's the main loop. Then in the second loop, we'll have a certain number of batches for each epoch, and then we'll generate random arrays with the, their size, the batch size, the size of the image, and then three channels for the fake images, and a single channel for the mask that represents the target output. For the mask, we'll just use the random generator, and we'll use the uh, greater than 0 0.7 to, to have a Boolean mask, where basically 30% of the pixels in our fake image will be assigned to class 1, and 70% of the pixels in our fake image will be assigned to the class 0. You can quickly check that this works. Because we use the yield keyword instead of the return for the method, we can use this method as a generator, and uh, we can iterate through all of the uh, batches and epochs, and we can check that we indeed receive 20 batches, so two epochs and 10 batches per epoch, and each batch contains five images of the correct shape. For the model, we use the Keras module from TensorFlow to create a very simple neural network. 
with the inputs defined with the shape of the image that we are expecting from our generator of data. And then we'll add just a single convolutional layer with 16 features and a three by three kernel and a rectified linear unit activation function. And then uh, an output layer that will also be uh, a convolution, a 2D convolution, but this time with two outputs that represent the uh, positive class and the negative class, and this time just a one by one kernel and a softmax activation function so that we will get a uh, class probability as the output of the uh, model. So it's a very simple model that doesn't do much, but then we can define the model with Keras uh, with our inputs and outputs, and we can use the compile method uh, of the model where we have to uh, determine which optimizer we're going to use, and so we'll be going to uh, use uh, the RMS prop by default, then we define the loss in our case, since segmentation is a um, per pixel classification problem, the best loss to use is generally the cross entropy. So we use the sparse categorical cross entropy. And uh, finally, once we have compiled our model, we can return it from our method. To test that this works, we can just call the get method method that we just defined and use the summary method of the model class from Keras to print in the terminal just a summary of all of the layers that we put in our model and we can check that this corresponds to what we defined. To fit our model, we can use the fit method from the model class of Keras, which take as input the generator, the, the data generator that we defined, the number of epochs and the number of batches per epoch. So to test it, we can now uh, write again our code to get our generator, so to generate the data with a certain batch size, number of epochs and batches per epoch. And then we can uh, construct our model with get model, print the summary, and use fit model to uh, fit the data to our model. And we will uh, be seeing if we use the correct parameters to our method, we'll finally see in the terminal that uh, it prints the, uh, the learning process, basically the summary of the learning process in the terminal, where we can see the metric that we currently define, which is the accuracy. So the, right now we are using just the simplest metric for our model, and we can see that the model is actually learning basically the prior probabilities of the data um, that, we, that we've put. So there is no logic to our data, but it sees that in general, uh, it's mostly negative, uh, the negative class, and so it will always predict the negative class and gets a, um, an accuracy of around 70%. And we can quickly check that that's what's happening by uh, changing the, the threshold in our random generator. If we put 0.85, now the accuracy will go up to 85% because it's still predicting always the same thing. The evaluate model method will take two uh, arguments, first the model itself and then a set of validation data. And the idea here is that we will use the predict method from the uh, model class uh, with the uh, validation data images. And if we take the argmax of the, uh, of the, the, the outputs across the third axis, so the third axis is the axis with just um, the two the channels of the output, so the, the channel 0 corresponding to the background class and channel 1 corresponding to the uh, positive class, and so the argmax will be 0 when the probability of being in the background is higher than the probability of being in the foreground and vice versa. And so we can compute now simple metrics on uh, based on the prediction and on the true uh, data uh, and for instance we can define easily the accuracy by comparing the prediction to the validation data and so if we make a boolean comparison between the two arrays it will be done element by element which means that if we sum this uh, this boolean resulting array it will be equal to uh, to true uh, wherever the prediction is equal to the validation data so if we sum it we'll have the number of pixels across all the um, validation sets where the prediction is equal to the validation data and you can then divide it by the total number of pixels in the validation data and this allows us to return the accuracy and we can then print that in the uh, on the terminal and check that this corresponds to the expected value in this case 85 percent
now we have a working pipeline, that's good. Uh, and before we start making the code a bit more complex with the real data sets and uh, more realistic uh, neural network model, uh, I will just quickly transform these methods into classes to make our lives a bit easier. So we'll be having uh, three classes in the end, the data generator, a model, and an evaluator. In our data generator, we will uh, have the initialization method, so the constructor that will create our um, our validation sets and uh, set up the, 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 the main attributes, so the batch size, batches per epoch, and the validation size. We'll have a method called net next batch, which will be our generator, and then we'll have a get validation data method that just returns the uh, validation data. For the model, we'll have first in our constructors the code that was basically in the get method uh, in the get model uh, method, so setting up the, the the model structure, the architecture of the model, and combining it with a given optimizer, the loss, and the metric. Then we will have a print uh, method just to, to display the summary uh, in the terminal a fit method to fit the model with a certain number of epochs and a data set, and a predict method where we will uh, just uh, predict the result of the model on a certain data. And so those, those methods right now are just basically calling the, um, the, the, the methods from the Keras uh, model class, but here by putting everything into our own class, uh, it means that we can afterwards uh, modify this to, to, to take into account the, 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 the other steps that we may want to add to our model. Now to check that all of this works, we can just modify our pipeline to use the classes instead of using the, um, the methods that we previously defined. Um, we'll not bother with the evaluator class at the moment because the, evaluate, the evaluation, uh, the real evaluation, especially on the test data, will really depend on the true data set that we are using. And at this stage, we just want to check that everything seems to be uh, working correctly. And for that, the, the accuracy that we have is more than enough. And in fact, if we want to have a, a, an accuracy computed on the validation data uh, throughout the, the, the training, we can directly use the built-in uh, fit method from uh, Keras where we can specify a, a validation data uh, either with a generator or with a um, just sending the validation data arrays as we are doing here and at each epoch in the, uh, in the training the uh, Keras will then uh, just test the model on the validation data and you will get the accuracy of the of the model on the training sets and on the validation sets at each epoch. And so we can check how the model is uh, training. And so we can see now on the terminal that all of that uh, has been working as expected once we import the uh, correct, uh, once we import the classes correctly in our pipeline. And we see that the result is exactly the same as before as expected. Now we have to adapt this generic pipeline to our gland segmentation problem. Let's start by looking at the evaluation. It's always a good idea to think about it early, because the metrics and criteria that we are going to use to evaluate our methods will certainly have an influence on what we want to put in the pipeline. So what do we want to evaluate here? The good news is, since the dataset comes from a challenge, we can see what metrics that challenge used. They define three different metrics that they call the detection F1 score, the object dice, and the outdoor distance. Their definitions are not totally standard, but the main idea is that they want to measure two different things. How good the algorithm is at detecting individual glands, and how good they are at measuring their morphology. For the detection F1 score, they look at each individual predicted object and try to find a matching object in the ground truth. If there is enough overlap between the two, it's considered as a true positive. Otherwise, it's a false positive. If there are remaining ground truth objects without a match, they are marked as false negatives. The object dice mixes detection with segmentation. We also look at matching objects, but we then compute a pixel level F1 score on their mask. 
this is a bit weird as it will be difficult to differentiate if a bad score is due to a bad detection or to a bad segmentation. Since we already have a detection score, we would probably gain more information by just looking at an overall segmentation score based on the binary mask instead of the labeled objects. The F1 score is also generally not a very good segmentation score as it's quite sensitive to unbalanced data. Using something like the Matthews Correlation Coefficient or MCC is often a better idea. The last score they define, the Ausdorf distance, also mixes detection with a morphological measure of how well the contours of the objects are matched. Hausdorff is also very sensitive to slightly noisy contours and can lead to very unstable rankings, so I'm not convinced it's a good choice here. So for our evaluation here, I will keep three different metrics. For detection, I will keep the precision and the recall instead of the F1 score. The F1 score alone doesn't really tell us enough about what the algorithm is doing, so keeping the two relevant bits of information separate is useful. We'll add a global MCC as a segmentation metric. Something interesting to note here is that part of the evaluation is based on individually labeled glands, not on a global mask. As our segmentation network produces a binary prediction, this gives us an indication that we will need some post-processing in the pipeline. But let's first go this evaluation. To test that we can properly compute everything we need, let's go to a Jupyter Notebook as it will be easier to see what's going on and to show the different steps of the process. First, we need to have an annotation and a prediction to check that it's working. We load an annotation from the dataset and we create a fake prediction. To create the fake prediction, we randomly remove some objects, then we randomly add some disks and we assign new labels to them. Finally, we use some morphological operations to do some deformation. Now let's look at the implementation for the detection metrics. We can start from the challenge evaluation as they release their evaluation code as a MATLAB script that I adapt here. The first step is to get the list of labels present in the ground truth and in the prediction. We can use NumPy's unique method to find every label and we remove the label zero which correspond to the background. Next, we have to find the best matches for each of the predicted objects. We store these matches in an array where, for each predicted label, we store the label of the best match and a flag indicating if there is enough overlap between the two. For each predicted label, we select the object by broadcasting the equals operation to every element of the array. This will give us a binary array of the same size as the image, with true for every pixel of the predicted object. We can now use this as a mask on the ground truth labels image to select every pixel of the predicted object in the ground truth image. If there is no ground truth label above zero, this means that the region is only background and therefore we are dealing with a false positive. Otherwise, we find the most represented label in this region using the mode method from SciPy. The most represented label will be the object with the most overlap. Just like we found the mask of the predicted object earlier, we can now find the mask of the ground truth object and we can compute their overlap. If the area of overlap is at least 50% of the area of the ground truth object, it's considered as a true positive. We can visually check that everything is in order. The green objects are true positives and the red are false positives. We can now easily compute the false negatives as it will simply be the difference between the total number of ground truth objects and the number of true positives. From there, we can compute the precision, which is the proportion of predicted objects which were correctly identified, and the recall, which is the proportion of ground truth objects which were correctly found. In our fake example here, we have a precision of 85% as 11 of the 13 predicted objects were correct, and a recall of 69% as we found 11 of the 16 ground truth objects. For the MCC, things are a bit easier as we work on the binary segmentation masks. We can simply compute the true positives, true negatives, false positives and false negatives at the pixel level, and from there derive the correlation coefficient. The main property of this coefficient is that it will be equal to zero for a random result, one for a perfect result, and negative for results which are worse than random, meaning that they systematically predict something contrary to the truth. This is very useful information as when that happens, it's usually a clear sign that there is a mistake somewhere in the pipeline as even a model that doesn't learn anything useful shouldn't get a negative score. 
Let's now move all the way to the other side of the pipeline and see how we can deal with the datasets. One thing that we can see in the dataset is that we have images of different sizes. This is usually the case in most real-world datasets, so that's not a surprise. There are actually very few different sizes here, as the dataset comes from selected regions from larger images, so we have something that's already relatively standardized. <coughs> as the names of the files follow a simple pattern, we can quickly get the names of all the files in the training sets, and as the dataset is not too big, we can load all the images directly in RAM, as it will make the rest go a lot faster. When it's possible, it's always a good idea to do so, as having to read things on the hard disk is always a potential bottleneck in these pipelines. So, how do we deal with these images of different sizes? Most networks require fixed size inputs. We have two main options, with their advantages and disadvantages. We can resize the images to a target size, or we can tile the images into fixed size patches. For the first option, we can use the resize method from scikit-image. We of course have to also resize the annotations, and we see here that by default, the resize method uses some interpolation and rescaling, so that we lose our distinct labels. To avoid that, we have to specify a few parameters to make sure that we still have a crisp segmentation. The main advantages of this method are that it's easy, and that we keep the whole context of the image. The main disadvantage is that we lose some resolution and we can introduce some deformation if we don't preserve the aspect ratio, which will often be the case if the input images don't all have the same one. So what about tiling? Tiling is the process of selecting tiles of fixed size from the image. The process here will depend on what we want to do with it. For training, we will generally want to randomly sample tiles from everywhere in the image. Those tiles will therefore not be resized or transformed in any way, but they will not see the entire context of the image. It's therefore important to use a tile size that is large enough to see the features that characterize the objects of interest. The problem with the tiles is that they cannot be used for the evaluation that we've defined. For the MCC it would be possible, but for the object level metrics it wouldn't make sense, as the tiles will often only see a single glance at a time, and we'll rarely see one in its entirety. So what we have to do here is to do a regular tiling of the image, predict the segmentation of all these tiles, and then stitch back those predictions together. This adds a step of post-processing, and it also adds some choices to our algorithm. How much overlap do we want between the tiles, and how do we decide the value of pixels, which have predictions coming from multiple tiles? Let's look at this tiling. We can first find out the minimum number of tiles that we need to cover the entire image. If the image size can be exactly divided by the tile size, we will have no overlap, but in general this is of course not the case. Next, we can compute by how much we need to move the window at each step, so that if we take the first tile on the top left of the image, the last tile ends up exactly on the bottom right corner. This gives us the coordinates of the different cells of this overlapping grid, and we can use the mesh grid method from NumPy to get all the combinations that we need. We can print the tiles to check that it seems to be working. Now, we create some fake predictions on these tiles so that we can visualize different stitching methods. Here, we will just predict some random number for each tile that we, we, that we set as the prediction for all the pixels in the tile. We then build two image predictions from the tiles one using the mean value from all predictions, and one using the maximum value from all predictions. We also keep track of how many predictions were made for each pixel in the image. As we can see, we have an interesting pattern emerging here. Some of the pixels have only a single prediction, others have two, and others have three. Using the mean seems like the most logical option, but you may run into some problem if the model tends to not detect very well objects which aren't in its center. The predictions from these cells may draw the final prediction value down. The max value may lead to some overestimation, but it basically makes the hypothesis that if the model detected the object of interest from one of its point of view onto the pixel, then it's probably there. We can also decide that we want a lot more overlap, and using different number of tiles will lead to different patterns and to longer computing time, of course. It's always important to keep note of these patterns, so that we are not surprised if they appear in the final prediction. 
We can partly reduce these patterns by using the average and using some weights so that the central part of a tile contributes more to the final prediction than the parts closer to the border. Now that we can get tiles or full images, we have to decide how to transform them into batches. The general idea here will be, for whole images, to randomly select n images, with, a, with n being the batch size, and to pre-process them. We will shuffle the image list at each epoch so that the network doesn't always see the images in the same order. We can use the shuffle method from the random module of NumPy to do that. Note that shuffle modifies the array passed as argument directly. For the tiles, we will create each batch for, from a single image, from which we will randomly sample n tiles. Again, we will shuffle the image list at each epoch. Finally, for our datasets, there is the question of data augmentation. Data augmentation consists in making small transformations of the image to improve the generalization capabilities of the algorithm. There are a lot of possibilities here, but I will go with some that are very easy to implement, quick to compute, and relatively common. First, we can do vertical and horizontal mirror images by just reversing the axis. Then we can add some Gaussian noise, again using NumPy's random module. The standard deviation of the normal will control the amount of noise and will therefore be yet another hyperparameter of our model. Lastly, I will add some random gamma correction with random gamma values between 0.5 and 1.5. This will randomly brighten or darken the image. We can now turn our attention towards what makes this a deep learning solution the convolutional neural network. The architecture of a neural network can take many different forms, but there are some general shapes used for different kinds of problems. For segmentation, the most common shape that we will find has two parts, an encoder part with convolutional and pooling layers to reduce the dimensions of the image while increasing the number of features, and a decoder part with convolutional and upscaling layers which decrease the number of features while increasing the dimensions to get an output with the same size as the input. At the beginning of the network, we will have a 256 by 256 by 3 image, and at the end we need to have a 256 by 256 by 2 image, where the two channels represent the probabilities for a pixel to belong to the background or foreground classes. Even within the constraints of the general segmentation architecture, we still have many choices that we can make. How many convolutional layers? How much pooling? This is difficult to determine before trying it out on the actual data. The general goal is to have enough pooling that the features at the middle of the network can see a large enough portion of the image to have the context they need to determine the class without losing too much resolution in the process. We also have a trade-off with the number of convolutions and the number of features. If we add more, we can represent more complex decision functions, but it will be more likely to overfit or to just not be able to learn. Let's start with a relatively simple and straightforward network. Two max pooling layers with convolutions in between, and two upsampling layers in the decoder part, with 128 features at the end of the encoder. We also have to choose the activation function. Here we chose a modified version of the RELU, or Rectified Linear Unit, which is very common and in general a good default choice. When we have convolutions, we also have to choose the padding strategy for the borders of the image. With the same padding, TensorFlow will add zeros around the borders so that the output size is equal to the input size. With valid padding, it will only keep the pixels where the convolution kernel fits, so the output will be slightly smaller than the input. Both are generally fine, but the same padding is a bit easier to work with as we can easily get the output size we want. Another thing that we have to decide with the model is the optimization algorithm, used to find the best weights. The ADAM optimizer is very commonly used, but you can find a list of others in the TensorFlow documentation. They all work relatively similarly and are general variations on the idea of gradient descent but there are some differences which may or may not work better in different cases, so it's also something to keep in mind if you see that the network isn't learning properly. Maybe a different optimizer will be better. Each optimizer will also come with its own parameters, such as the learning rate or regularization parameters, but if we set it with a string here, as we do here, 
we will just use the default values. How can we potentially improve on this model? One possibility is to add short skip connections to form residual units. The basic idea of short skip connections is to provide a way for the gradients to flow more easily to the early layers of the network, which makes it easier for the optimizer to converge. Practically, we implement it by adding shortcuts through the network where we re-inject the outputs of an earlier layer to a later stage of the network. We could also add long skip connections, such as can be seen in the unit architecture, where shortcuts are made from the encoder part to the decoder part. This allows us to reintroduce high-resolution information into the later stages of the network, which generally improves the quality of the segmentation. As we've seen with the evaluation, we will need some post-processing in the model. It's a bit hard to really work on that before we get some outputs from the network, but the main idea is relatively straightforward. We need labeled regions from the segmentation probabilities, so we will need to binarize the probabilities, label connected regions, remove the noise, and close any holes within the objects. All of those tasks can be done easily with scikit-image, and we will have to see later on if we need to add some other things there. That was a lot of different things, so let's take a step back to look at the full pipeline that we have described here and the different choices that we will have to make. For training, we start by shuffling the image list at each epoch. Then we have to choose between the full image solution or the tiled image solution. In the first case, we read n images, with n being the batch size, we resize them and compile them into a batch. In the other version, we read one image, select n random tiles, and compile them into a batch. In both cases, we have a choice to make, the size of the tiles or of the resized images. We then have a data augmentation method to produce batches that can be used to train the model. And here we have to choose which one we want to use. To predict the results on one image, we'll either have to resize it or to split it into regular tiles, where we have to choose which kind of overlap we want. Then we use the model to predict the class probabilities of every pixel. In the tile case, we then have to stitch the results back together. Once we have a prediction map for the whole image, we can go through the post-processing and finally compute the evaluation metrics. All of these steps can now be implemented into our data generator, model and evaluator classes. If we want to test the different versions of the data generator and the model, we can implement some subclasses to take into account the different possibilities. So let's quickly have a look through the code to see how we implemented all of that and how we uh, translated the code from the notebooks into our different classes so that we can run our experiments. Um, first of all, we have the data generator class, which will have two uh, subclasses, the full image data generator and the tile data generator for the two versions of data uh, generation. So the main data generator will, um, will perform the, the, the tasks that are common for both the full image and the uh, tiled version, uh, which means setting some parameters about the batch size, validation size, the directory where the data is, preloading all of the full images and annotations in memory so that they are available either for resizing or for tiling, uh, creating the train and validation uh, splits, and we are setting a random seed uh, here so that we always do the, the same train validation splits. That way we will be able to compare the, the, the uh, fairly the results that we get from uh, different um, runs of our experiments because we know that uh, since we are shuffling right after um, setting the random seed, the uh, random shuffle here will always be exactly the same. And so we'll always have the same uh, images in the training set and the same images in the validation set. Uh, so this is fairly important when we are not using cross-validation, uh, but we are only using one uh, training validation split uh, to make sure that every version of the experiment that we run are using the same uh, data sets, otherwise we are not uh, comparing uh, things fairly. The other thing that we will find in this class is the uh, augmentation method. So the data augmentation method, which is just a static method, so it can be called from outside of the class and um, it just takes as inputs 
the uh, images of a mini batch and the annotations, and it performs the different data augmentation steps that we've seen in the notebook. So randomly drawing if it needs to do a vertical symmetry, a horizontal symmetry, randomly draw, uh, drawing a gamma correction, and uh, some random noise. And we can see that it performs so the vertical and horizontal symmetry are just done um, or not for the entire uh, mini batch, so it's uh, just so that it's uh, slightly easier and uh, faster to, to, to run. Um, but since each mini batch will be seen uh, multiple times, uh, in the end, every image will be probably uh, will end up being flipped in uh, in both direction a few times uh, during the training. Um, so for the full image data generator, we um, initialize in the, in the same way as before, but in addition, we can set up that the, um, the, the, the image size, the, the, so the, the target uh, of the resizing. Um, we can compute the number of batches that we will have for each epoch, which will be um, for the full images. We, 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 have, we take um, the batch size and uh, at each, each uh, mini batch we'll, uh, we'll have this number of uh, full images in it. So the number of batches per epoch is the number of images in the training sets divided by the batch size. And we can uh, for the um, can compute the the images that will be part of the training and validation sets by pre-processing the images and annotations here with these methods, uh, which will do the resizing, um, so simple resizing for the images and the resizing while making sure that we are not using any kind of interpolation for the annotations. Um, so this allows us to also have ready in memory the validation and training sets full validation and training set, so it will go a lot faster for training. Um, and so the, the other thing that we need is uh, a method to um, yield the next batch, so a generator that will uh, provide us with the different batches. And here for this, uh, this full image data generator, this is fairly easy. At each, uh, um, for, 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 for the, the training, we take a certain number of epochs and we will uh, run through all of these epochs, uh, each time shuffling the training sets, and then for uh, the number of batches that we need, uh, we compute. We just take the uh, the next uh, the next images in the in the training sets, and uh, we just iterate through the training sets, taking uh, each time the number of images to form the batch size, and we just pass that through the data augmentation. Um, and getting the validation data is just about getting the pre-computed uh, arrays that we that we have here. And I, I also made another method so that I can either get the validation data with the validation, uh, with the notation binarized, so that I can compute um, the, the loss function. And uh, so this will be used during training uh, to compute the loss function and uh, all the things that, all the metrics that just need a binary mask. But I also want to be able to get the validation data with the labels so that I can um, compute the uh, different metrics uh, based, uh, based on the labels also with it. Um, with the tile data generator, we will have uh, things uh, slightly more complicated since we need to do the uh, tiling and the stitching. So the, the additional parameters that we have here are the tile size. In this tile, the number of batches per epoch will simply be the number of images in the training set since we are um, taking all of the, uh, the tiles from the same image at each uh, batch. So for the next batch uh, method, um, we also need to uh, yield a batch of, uh, with a tuple of the images and annotations at each step. Uh, so the beginning is the same. We go through the epochs and shuffle the training sets. But this time, we take the uh, one image and one annot corresponding annotation. And from there, we, um, we use this uh, get tiles method to compute uh, where the tiles uh, are, um, so to compute some random tiles. Uh, so with the get tiles here, we, we just um, randomly draw um, certain uh, positions in the, in the image. And uh, we fill the, the batch with the tiles that are at these random positions. So we just randomly uh, 
randomly sample with uh, just a uniform distribution, randomly sample the different coordinates in the in the image to get the uh, the batch. Um, so this allows us to get the uh, training data and for the validation data. This time we um, we do things slightly differently. Uh, since for validation we want to have the regular tiling um, and so this time for all the images in the validation sets uh, we can just return the full images but we have to go to each image get a regular tiling and the regular tiling um, we can have the different overlap method just trying to have as, as few overlap as possible or uh, I also implemented the version where we have a lot more overlap that is uh, um, that is made in the in the image, and um, and then we we get the different coordinates that we need to create this uh, grid of regular tiles, and we return that. Um, and so for this uh, with this validation data, we with the regular tiling can go through all of the tiles and fill in uh, the uh, validation x and y with the content of the images and annotations. Um, so this way we will have. Uh, all of the parts of the image in the uh, validation data. Um, again, we have a version with the with the the labels and with all the labels which I yeah here uh, is implemented here. So if the labels uh, are here is to 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 true, we will get the full annotations um, with the different labels, and otherwise we binarize it uh, to get just the binary data the binary mask. And so we also need a method to uh, stitch back the image together and for that we um, what we need to stitch are the predictions. So we need uh, an array that will contain uh, so a list of all the, pre the, the prediction for the tiles uh, of the image and uh, um, the shape of the um, of the original uh, image and so we can do the uh, opposite operation basically to the uh, so where we get uh, the regular tiling uh, again, and uh, from this uh, regular tiling, we we can just uh, uh, put the different tiles at their at their position in the original image and uh, perform the stitching. Uh, in this case, we are using just the uh, mean method, so the average method. Um, so for the um, this allows us to the data generation for the full image and the tiles. And for the for the model, we will have uh, uh, so everything that concerns uh, building and training the uh, neural network itself. So we, again, we have a few different classes. One main class that that has all of the uh, common uh, part of the process, and then we have um, the specific class. For the that just contain basically the architecture of uh, the different specific models that we have. So our basic model, one with the short skip and one with the long skip. Um, so these only contain the uh, the architecture, and then all the rest is common for uh, for all of these classes. And it's basically setting up the uh, pipeline for the model. So we set the um, the image size here, the the, the classifier name. Um, if we are loading an already trained model. Um, if you are not sorry, if we are not loading an already trained model, then we call this uh, set model uh, method, which will be implemented at in each of the subclasses, and then we create the uh, optimizer with the learning rate at and epsilon, um, and we compile the model with this optimizer and the uh, different uh, losses. Uh, if we have a load from here that is uh, specified, so if we if we want to load an already trained model, we we'll use the uh, Keras load model method to to get the um, the model, and we need to uh, specify that uh, we are using some leaky ReLU uh, activation function because it's uh, otherwise the load model does not recognize that um, that uh, activation function it will make an error when trying to load it. We have then a method to just print the summary, plot the model to a um, to a, a, an image file just to be able to do to look at it, uh, save the trained model, um, and then the uh, fit, predict, and post process. So fit, which will call the fit method of the model, and 
use the uh, so it takes a, a data set so one of the data generator if we call the next batch for um, in order to get the uh, generator um, the batch generator for training um, specify a certain number of epochs the number of steps per epoch that have been computed at the level of the data generator um, the validation data uh, for early stopping and the callbacks which will be um, the early stopping so with a certain patient so if the network does not learn for a certain amount of uh, iteration so if it doesn't improve on the cross entropy on the validation sets then it will stop learning and a, uh, another callbacks which is model checkpoints so that will it will always save the um, latest best version of the model so each time we have a, um, a model that improves on the uh, validation cross entropy then it will uh, be saved it will be saved to uh, this uh, this file so that we can uh, always get the um, the best the best version available of the model um, for the predict, we are just calling the uh, predict from the model, and then we also have the method that implements the post processing on an image, and so this takes as input the prediction. Uh, uh, so not actually the mask, the the, the mask, but the uh, prediction probabilities, and a, an additional parameter which is the minimum uh, area uh, to consider uh, that an, that a gland is an object and not some random noise. Um, and so we will uh, remove all the objects that are smaller than this minimum area and then um, fill the holes uh, using the uh, field image of uh, region props. Um, finally, we have the evaluator that will uh, compute the different um, the different metrics that we've uh, seen in the notebook. Um, and uh, it will have one main method which is here, uh, evaluate that will um, uh, take a, uh, a model and so a train model and uh, uh, data, the data generator um, and it we, it we can specify if you want to, tr to uh, compute the metrics on the training set or on the, the validation sets and then the method that we want to use for the uh, stitching and uh, and some parameter for the post-processing. Um, and so what we will do here is just select the images that we want to compute the metrics on, either the f all the images from the training or from the validation sets. And then we go through all of these uh, images. If we our data generator is the uh, tiled data generator, then we need to first get the, um, the tiling. And then for each tiles, we will predict uh, the, the, the we predict the, the, the classes uh, using the model and we can then uh, stitch those predictions together to get the uh, predicted image and uh, use the post-processing to get the predicted uh, label um, and if it's, a, if it's not a tile data generator so it's the full image, image generator and in that case we can just pre-process the image and uh, once we get the prediction we just have to uh, so we don't have to stitch anything, but we do have to resize it again uh, back to the uh, to the origi original image size. Otherwise, the, the the metrics that we are using, especially the um, the MCC, might uh, be um, slightly different since we we are not uh, looking at the same number of pixels. Um, and then we can again post process the uh, results and as well um, the. Uh, the the post processing would not be the same, of course, if we were uh, if we kept the, um, the 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 smaller sized image, since the, the the area is computed as a number of pixels in this case. So if we are using the smaller the smaller prediction image, then we would have to change that parameter. While here we can use the same uh, mean area um, across uh, the different uh, experiments and uh, and have a result that we can compare together fairly. Um, and finally, uh, once we have uh, for the image the, uh, the full prediction labels image, then we can uh, compute the different metrics uh, by comparing it to the uh, true the ground truth that we have from the annotations. And this is this get metrics that just implements uh, what we've 
um, shown in the, in the notebooks, so the precision, the recall, based on the, uh, on the unique objects. And we just added something to, to remove the, the very small objects in the, in the ground truth, because we noticed that uh, there were some images where there were just objects with like two, one or two pixels um, that were identified as, uh, as, as an object, like in a corner of the, of the image. And this, of course, is completely impossible to predict. But here it would count as a false positive or false negative. Uh, as a false positive, sorry, uh, or true positive, uh, when when it doesn't really have uh, make a lot of sense uh, to 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 count them, uh, so I just discard them uh, here. Um, and since anyway we are also discarding the small objects in the in the prediction, uh, this uh, should not. Uh, this seems like a, like something fair to do to get a more accurate uh, reading on the. Uh, on the performance of the algorithm. And so this is just due, um, this is basically an artifact to the way that the dataset has been presented since the dataset has been made uh, by cutting some smaller images from a, um, from a larger um, uh, slide. Um, so we sometimes, uh, the, the way that it was cut just happened to include a few pixels from, from um, uh, uh, an object that was on the, basically on the next uh, tile. Um, so it, uh, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, it's, an, it's an artifact of the way the dataset was created and it should not influence the results of the, uh, of the algorithms that we get. Uh, so we compute the precision recall and the MCC on the binary masks. And, uh, and finally, we have the code to perform the different experiments that, that, we, that we want. So we want to have some generic code that we can uh, call uh, and modify the different hyperparameters on it so that we can just make as many tests as we, as we want. And so here we will have this train experiment method where we uh, will pass a dictionary that will contain all of the hyperparameters that we want to uh, set. So we have to set uh, the which data generator we want to use, which model we want to use, uh, a name uh, to give to the to the classifier so that we can um, identify the, the, the results of that experiment later. And, um, and then all uh, the uh, optional parameters that we may want to change or we may want to just keep the default, so for the learning rates, the overlap, the maximum number of epochs, etc., cetera, uh, etc. Cetera. Um, and then we uh, just clear the session, train the um, the model on the on the data using all of those uh, hyperparameters. So with this. Uh, um, so creating the generator, the model, and the uh, and fitting the, 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 the model to the data. Um, then we'll just save uh, some figures with the um, with the, the loss and accuracy uh, during uh, during training. So on the training and validation sets, so that we can check back later uh, how the training um, happened. And then uh, once the model is uh, fully trained, we can compute the different metrics um, so on the um, on the the training data and on the validation data so that we have um, an estimation of basically the descriptive performance and the predictive performance of the algorithm and we save also all of that to a uh, text file so that we can uh, check back later how um, our different models performed and so from that we can now this define basically all of the experiments that we that we want to, to do. We can do as few or as many as we want, change whichever hyperparameter we want depending on uh, what we want to find out. And then we just have to run through the experiments and to let the computer run for as long as it takes to get all of these results. When it comes to deciding which hyperparameters we want to test, it all depends on what we want to learn. Are we more interested in learning about the influence of different choices in the architecture? Then we should focus on making variations there while keeping the rest constant. Do we want to work more on the post-processing? Then we should try to get some good baseline results and then focus our attention to improving that part. Some important rules to follow here is that while developing code for post-processing, for instance, you should always develop while looking at the training sets 
so that you can check on the validation set afterwards while still keeping the test set on the side. You always have to keep that in mind, play with the training sets, find the best hyperparameters using the validation sets, and only at the end will you be able to use the test sets. Here are some of the experiments I made to give you an idea. I mostly wanted to see whether it was better to use full resized images or to use the tied version, and if the short skip and long skip connections were helping in any way. My main experiment, therefore, consisted in looking at the six possible combinations. First, I had to see if the main hyperparameters of the optimizer, the learning rate and early stopping patience, were correct. I quickly saw that the values had to be slightly different in the tied version and in the full image version, which isn't that surprising. The amount of samples is very different in both cases, and in the tiled version, each mini batch only comes from a single full image, meaning that a higher learning rate will probably skew the results too much towards learning the content of that particular image at each batch. I also had to let the training go for many more epochs than what it seemed when using a patience of 15. Using a higher patience and letting the network run for 500 or 1000 epochs clearly improved the results, particularly for the tied version. So these were the basic hyperparameters set for the rest of the experiments. A learning rate of 0.001 and epsilon of 10 to the power of minus 7 for the full image version, and values 10 times smaller for the tied version. In both cases, we set a patience of 100 with a maximum number of epochs of 1000. This obviously increases the training time. For the full image version, training these took about 20 minutes, and for the tied version, around 2 hours. There is certainly room for optimization there. After training all 6 combinations of model and data generator, I looked at the post-processing hyperparameters. Looking at the training set, a minimum area of 2000 pixels seemed to give the best trade-off between removing noise and keeping most true positives. Using minimum or maximum overlap led to almost identical results, with the maximum overlap method taking much longer to compute predictions, so we keep the minimum version. Now, using those values, we can look at the results that interest us most. First, we look at the results on the training data, the descriptive performance. On the detection metrics, it seems very clear that the full image generator leads to better results than the tiled version. The MCC gives a similar indication. It's a bit less clear for the network architecture, as there is no clear preference among them for the tile version, but the long skip model does seem a bit better with the full image. Does the validation data tell a different story? Well, it seems so. The results are not quite as good, which is expected. The data generator still influences the results more than the network. This time, the tied version is clearly a bit biased against the positive class, as its precision is very high, but its recall has become a lot worse. This time, for the full image, the short skip is slightly ahead of the long skip in detection, and the long skip is slightly ahead in segmentation with the MCC. So, what are our conclusions here? First, all the modifications that we did in the data generation and in the post-processing had more effects than any change we made in the network itself. This is very common, and it shows just how important it is to think about the entire pipeline and not just the network. How we generate the data and what post-processing we do is what differentiates the results here. Second, that at least in this particular task, it's better to use the full context of the image, even with a lower resolution, than to cut it into smaller tiles. Looking at some images for the full image long skip version, we can see that its main problem seems to be in separating glands which are close together. This is something that had to be expected, and there are several approaches to try to solve it. We could either work more on the post-processing, or change the problem definition a bit by adding a third class for borders between gland, which will allow us to penalize the network during learning when it tries to fuse results from neighboring glands. This has been shown in previous studies to significantly improve the results for this particular problem. Based on that, let's set up our final test. We will retrain the long skip model for 500 epochs on the full training sets and finally use the test sets to get our final results. First, we check the loss history. 
just to see that nothing weird happened. The shape of the learning curve is very similar to what we saw in the previous trainings. So this is a good sign, no big surprise here. Next, we can look at the actual scores. There are two different test sets in the challenge, test A and test B, whose results were computed separately in the challenge. On test A, we have some excellent results with a precision of over 90% and a recall of 80% and a MCC of around 0.8. On test B, things aren't so good. Only 58% recall and 55% prediction, with the MCC at 0.7. Looking at the images, it seems that the test B glands tend to be more irregularly shaped than the test A glands, and these are the glands that our model struggle more to find. So how do we compare to the state of the art? We didn't use the same segmentation metrics, but we can see how we compare in detection by computing the F1 score from our precision and recall. If we look at the results published on the challenge website and plot our own results on it, we can see that we are globally in the same range as the top algorithms on test A and a bit behind on test B. However, test B is worse for everyone, which indicates that our performance drop is not completely unexpected. Could we do better? Probably, but the goal that we set here wasn't to beat the challenge participants. What we wanted was to get some knowledge on the methodology, and that is what we achieved. We know that in the context of gland segmentation, having more context at a lower resolution appears to be better than using smaller regions at higher resolutions. If we want to keep working on the actual problem of prostate cancer grading, this is certainly valuable information. And gaining this type of information is usually a better goal to set than trying to improve by a few points on the arbitrary metrics of a particular challenge. And so we can now conclude this video. I hope that this case study can be helpful to decide how to approach an image analysis task with deep learning. Different tasks will prompt different kinds of choices and will lead to different directions. This video only showed a little portion of all the things that we have to explore when trying to solve these kinds of problems. All the code from the video is available on GitHub and you will find all the relevant links in the description. Goodbye and thank you for watching.